we did our event yesterday at the law school, which was a slightly different group, more so students and some faculty and staff in the group here today um, is more so, I would say, community members who are involved in different aspects of the criminal legal system. So um, without doing full introductions, I can just share that we work with all of these incredible people in different capacities, but everyone has a different sort of role in their work at different ends of the spectrum within the criminal legal system. So thank you all for being here today. Um, and I'll introduce our guests. So we have Barb Taves, who is an associate professor in criminal justice at the University of Washington, Tacoma. In addition to empirical and theoretical journal articles, Barb is co-author with Howard Zare of Learning from Life, 22 Lifers, 25 Years Later, Critical Issues in Restorative Justice, and is also the author of Little Book of Restorative Justice for People in Prison, and is the current series editor for the Little Books of Justice and Peacebuilding series. Her research focuses on relationships among restorative justice, environmental design, and psychosocial behavioral judicial and trauma healing outcomes for people who have been harmed, people who have caused harm and justice practitioners. For two decades prior to becoming faculty, Barb held leadership positions in restorative justice and criminal justice nonprofit organizations. This included two community-based victim offender dialogue programs, as well as an agency that advocated and provided services, services for incarcerated people and their families through whom she developed and facilitated restorative justice programs in collaboration with incarcerated men and women. She's an experienced victim offender dialogue facilitator in both nonviolent and violent crimes. Next, we have Howard Zare. Howard began as a practitioner and theorist in restorative justice in the late 1970s as a, at the foundational stage of growth within the criminal justice field as hundreds of events, sorry, he has led hundreds of events in more than 25 countries, 35 states, including trainings and consultations on restorative justice, victim offender dialogue, conferencing, judicial reform, and other criminal justice matters. There was an early advocate of making the needs of victims central to the practice of restorative justice. A core theme in his work is respect and dignity for all people. As a prolific writer, editor, speaker, educator, and photojournalist, Zare has continued to actively mentor others in the field through courses, intensive workshops in restorative justice, and through his work at the Zaire Institute of Restorative Justice at the Center for Justice and Peacebuilding, Eastern Mennonite University. And last but certainly not least, we have John Frederick Knoll, or Freddie Knoll, who is a contributor featured in the first book, Doing Life, which was published in 1996, as well as this current book, which I will circulate around as we're listening. The current book, Still Doing Life, was published in 2022. These books capture a glimpse into the lives and stories of individuals like Freddie, who have embarked on a continuous journey of their own sense of purpose and healing, despite the many confines and challenges experienced by those enduring the reality of a life sentence. Freddie served 49 years in prison after being sentenced at age 17. He was released in January 2019 as a result of the Supreme Court decisions in 2016 and 2021 that ruled against mandatory life sentences for those sentenced as youths. Freddie is married with three sons, three granddaughters, and three cats. <laughs> he continues to work with criminal justice and prison reform programs, including coordinating a program called Meeting at the Door, which helps returning justice involved individuals transition back to society. Thank you three again for joining us today, yeah. and I will yeah. pass it over to you. All right, I am going to quick share my screen. All right, so um, what we're gonna do for the next 30, 40 minutes or so is talk about the book, Still Doing Life. And um, we're gonna talk about kind of just summary what it is, but then the evolution of the project, motivations for the three of us to be involved in it. And then just a summary of some of the key learnings that we take away with it and then um, end with Freddie doing some um, longer sharing about his experience as someone who had a life without the possibility of parole sentence and kind of what his learnings are, um, experiences were coming out of that. While doing that, in the background here, um, 
We'll just be going through slides that include pairings that are in the book and quotes um, that go along with them that are part of the exhibit. And at two points, we'll actually play audio of someone reading the 2017 interview for um, two of the folks who are in the book. So um, I'll just kick it off by giving an overview of the book and then what our goals were with it. So um, the book builds on what Howard did in his earlier book in the 90s called Doing Life, in which um, he interviewed and photographed uh, men and women in Pennsylvania prisons who had life without the possibility of the parole. So this book is again, including portraits and interviews of a subset of those original lifers that he talked with and exploring the notions of, you know, how does one cope? What's happened over the last 25 years that all these folks have been incarcerated and how are they coping? How have they gotten through that quarter century since the last time they had talked? And so um, what the book does is it actually pairs the portrait and interview from the mid 90s, which was published in the earlier book, uh, with the 2017 portrait and interviews. So we really can see and read um, side by side what those 25 years have been like for folks. And some of them reflect on that earlier interview and who they were at that time and who they are now. And our hope with the hope with the book is that the reader picks it up and um, really engages with the humanity of these men and women and you know, really starts to critically think and even engage in dialogue about extreme sentences such as life without the possibility of parole. We don't go in uh, making any statements about whether it should be abolished or not. Um, we really want people to, we're not trying to sway them in that direction, really wanting them to engage and do some critical thinking on it. Certainly Howard and I have our perspectives on it, um, but that isn't the goal of the book. Um, it really is to spark conversation and thinking on this topic. Um, to get us started, we're gonna hear from Yvonne Cloud, and um, she's just gonna tell us a little bit about what her experience is. is. She reflects back um, a little bit on her participation in the earlier book. And she also mentions the impact that doing life that earlier book has had in the prison. Um, she also mentions a woman named Peachy. And Peachy is Sharon Wiggins. She was in the earlier book and has since died. And actually, the book is dedicated to Peachy because of the, um, the important role she played in the lives of many of the women. And uh, Yvonne speaks to that. So with that, we will hear from Yvonne. I'm more outspoken and mature now. I found my voice and am able to express myself. I'm coping in a better and more positive way that will benefit me, as well as others in the community. Back then, when I was first interviewed, I was somewhat shy, still in denial, and didn't want to talk that much or let anybody know I had a life sentence. I still have the same determination to do positive things and give back to other people and change their lives for the better. I took a life. Now, I try to save lives. Even though I'm here, I can still make a difference and guide other people in the right direction. Peachy was definitely an influence on me. She met me at a time when I was in my 20s, acting like a little kid, running around and doing the wrong things. I had all this potential and Peachy brought that out of me. It was a sad day when she passed away on Palm Sunday. It was like the whole campus stopped because she inspired so many people. I spent years and years facilitating groups, everything I can grab, inspired by Peachy. I worked 10 years in the drug and alcohol therapeutic community. I recently became a certified peer specialist. I go all over campus helping the young offenders, 
letting them know that even though they're here, they can still make good choices and not repeat their mistakes. I go door to door in the mental health unit, inspiring and motivating people, letting them know there is hope. They can change. People have done it. I also work in admissions, so I talk to women as they come to the prison, letting them know about all the positive this institution has to offer. People come here and make things so much harder for themselves than it has to be. They come here with two to four years and end up doing the whole four years when they don't have to. It's all in the way we think. If you think positive, nine times out of 10, you're going to do positive things. If you think negative, your behavior is going to reflect that. In 1993, I came close to getting my degree before they snatched away the Pell Grants. I had training for the hospice program. I worked in Project Impact for five years. I received the Lisa Wanger Award in 2004 for all the good things I've done as far as school. I received the Inmate of the Year Award in 2006. I've been doing a lot of positive things for a long time. Even though I don't know what the future holds, I'm determined to stay on the straight and narrow and continue to help other people, pay it forward, teach others what somebody taught me. That's what I do mostly, even on the weekends. These activities make me feel good about myself knowing that I'm helping change other people's lives. I am very busy, but I make sure I get my rest. It's mandatory, or I wouldn't be able to do any of this. Most of the older lifers are mentors. You have some lifers, sad to say, who are still bitter, angry about their situation, like there's no hope. Then you have the ones like me, who just want to make the best of our situation and help others along the way. People ask me, oh my God, how do you ever do so much time? I say, well, I have no choice in the matter. All I can do is the best I possibly can, take one day at a time, sometimes one second at a time, and keep my head up high and be as strong as I can and give back to other people. I always remind my family that I'm strong and tell them all the things I do every day. I don't want them worrying about me. Some people go by what they see on TV. They don't know. They've never been here. So it's our job to let them know that we're okay. I try my best to keep them strong and let them know that I'm taking good care of myself. Thank God my son has never been in trouble. Doing life is in the library. It reached all over the campus. A lot of people really appreciate that. And a lot of them didn't know about life sentences. Some inmates walk by us every day and don't have a clue unless they sit down and talk to us. The book brought up a lot of people's awareness about life sentences and how we cope with it from day to day. It's taken me many years to forgive myself for the wrongs that I've done. I didn't have any right to take the life of another human being and I have deep remorse for doing so. If I can turn back the hands of time and make a different choice, I would, but I can't. Today, I'm still suffering the consequences for my actions on that fateful day 37 and a half years ago. Howard, do you want to say a bit about the history of the book and your motivations for doing it? When uh, just watching this reminds me when Yvonne came in the room in 2017, she was a bundle of energy and she had a pack of papers. She wanted me to know that she was a different person than she was 
when I met her in, in the early 1990s. She felt like she had been so young and immature and inarticulate. And uh, she now had a resume with full of accomplishments uh, and a lot of, a lot of motivation. Um, I'm a, yeah, I, I've been a serious photographer for many years and I've spent my career in the justice field, particularly around restorative justice, but other related issues. Uh, and I'm always trying to find a way to use photography in the service of justice, but also to use my, to do my photography in a way that's consistent with restorative justice. Um, and I think that photography done right has a huge potential to create bridges between people, to create dialogue around issues, to personalize people. Not all photography is that way. A lot of photography actually others people. It is, it, it does things that makes us reminds us of the differences between us and them. And a lot of prison photography is that way. So I wanted not to do that. I wanted to present people the way I want to be presented. So that, and I wanted to deprive people of the stereotypic clues that might th that might cause them to make jump to conclusions about people. So I used these plain backdrops. Uh, I set up a little studio in the prison. I got permission from the Department of Corrections to do it. And I worked closely with lifers as my uh, guides and accountability for the project. Uh, and so I interviewed, photographed some 75 people, not quite all got in the book because of the space. Uh, and it was also a traveling exhibit and, and some other things. Um, and and I, it had, I've got a lot of feedback I've heard from, believe it or not, I've heard from crime victims who said, you know, I read that book. And I'm starting to think differently about people who offend and even can I write to some of these people? Can I go to prison with you and so forth? I've heard from people who were on juries that could not bring themselves to vote for a life sentence after reading the book. So, it, uh, and I've had remarkably little negative feedback even from the victim community. In fact, I will we'll tell you that in a minute. So I'd always wanted to go back, uh, but permission of the policies don't allow it. But the former, the retired head of psychological services for Pennsylvania's Department of Corrections really loved this project. And he thought, I just had to go back. And so he went to the superintendent of the Department of Corrections and they reluctantly gave permission for me to go back. So I, I didn't get to do everyone. I got to do 20, 21, 22 of the people that I had interviewed before. But I went back and uh, we talked about what had happened since that time, how they were coping, what they had learned, and that kind of thing. And eventually, it, uh, working with Barb, it became this book that you see here, and now also some traveling exhibits. Um, I've also done, by the way, a book, a similar book with victims of severe crime, and one with children whose parents are in prison with similar style and similar goals. I also did a book on pickups, people in Virginia, their pickup trucks, but that's a whole nother, another <laughs> story. Uh, but so, so my, our, my goal here, is, as Barb said, is really to create, to allow people to speak for themselves, allow us to in, engage with real people, not just the stereotypes that we often use when we talk about justice issues. Uh, so that's the basic background of the book. We can you can you have questions as we go and you can raise those but that's the basic uh motivation and background for the book as far as my motivation for getting involved um one when howard asks you to be involved in a project of course i'm going to do it so he's roped me into a few things here and there. And um, also because of my time at working at the Pennsylvania Prison Society, um, which is actually the oldest nonprofit in the US that started even before Eastern State Penitentiary um, had opened. Um, I had my work in doing restorative justice in Pennsylvania prisons had me working very closely with um, people with life sentences because they were the ones who had the leadership who were the movers and shakers in the prison, as you, Yvonne mentions in her interview. And they were also the ones who had already been involved in some kind of restorative justice work from actually some earlier projects that Howard had been involved in. And so um, I was attuned to life sentences 
knew people who had life sentences, including knowing some of the people that were in doing life because of their work already with restorative justice. So I was very interested in getting involved to, you know, because of the goals of the book, but then also just because I had um, personal relationships with some people who had life without the possibility of parole or life sent or sentences that were so long that they were effectively life sentences. And so there was a real personal and professional motivation um, to be working to get this book out there. Freddie, do you want to say a little bit about um, your motivation? Yeah, uh, actually, you know, I, I, I had quite a few uh, reasons for being, uh, for wanting to participate uh, in the book, and I was glad. But the first one was to bring a little humanistic aspect of what lifers go through. Uh, for me, I came in, uh, like I said, I was arrested in uh, 69. I was 17 years old. I was sentenced by the time I was 19. And I entered the state correctional institution uh, at Greater Ford, where there was there was nothing. Basically, the, uh, it was a very bland uh, situation then. Uh, you know, no TVs, no radios, uh, no real access to school, uh, very little religious opportunities going on at the time. But when Doc came along uh, uh, doing, uh, doing life, we were also in, in the midst of trying to get uh, life, parole eligibility for lifers. And the book offered me at least the opportunity to show uh, what growth and development in prison could do. Uh, you know, there's, there's not often a lot said about uh, prison uh, really having a positive benefit on individuals. And, and, and that's true because it's, you know, they never get to the point where they can see that a person has truly rehabilitated themselves. They never get to the point where they can see where a life sentence prisoner committed one bad decision and is doing time now, you know, with the possibility of dying, what we call it death by incarceration when you're doing life because you're, you're, you're basically just forgotten about. But doc, Dr. Zare gave uh, me and, and, and a lot of other lifers the opportunity to, you know, to tell our stories, to, to you know, to put a face to some of the, um, you know, some of the people that that exist in prison, why they exist in prison, what their hopes are, uh, dreams, the fact that they still have families, and basically just say that we're still people. We're still able to be. Uh, we're still able to change. We're still able to love, care. We're, we're able to give back uh, in spite of being, you know, incarcerated and under those circumstances. We're eager to learn. We're eager to develop. We're eager to change, change our lives and 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 present ourselves as uh, uh, possibly uh, productive individuals. If the, if if getting if gotten out we can actually be contributors uh, to our communities. So, you know, like I said, there were many motivations for me participating in the book, uh, uh, but definitely the opportunity to uh, give a different uh, perspective of life sentence prisoners that existed in, that exist in Pennsylvania. As you can probably imagine, it's a heavy book. Um, in the sense of emotionally heavy. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of things that are disheartening, discouraging, um, infuriating in the book to think that people are incarcerated um, for life. And as we were reflecting on the interviews as a whole, um, while putting together the book, really realized that even amidst um, despair and a lack of hope, um, there were a lot of positive kind of universal messages that we can all take away from what lifers 
um, in the book are saying. And what we did is we close off the book with um, an essay that explores some of those themes and um, kind of the framing of it is really looking at the idea of transformation and healing, particularly through a trauma lens and how um, the folks in the book have really done so much to uh, find meaning in their lives, to figure out kind of who they are and what their purpose in life is, and to do things related to that purpose, whether it is getting involved in community organizations, becoming um, kind of the leaders within the prison, whether it's through organizations or um, being trained as um, people who are doing social work type things within the prison. Um, also a lot about strategies for coping, you know, with faith, with exercise, with, um, you know, deep spirituality, with art, um, those sorts of things. And also, um, even though Howard never asked anyone in the book about what they did, um, almost everyone talks about wishing they had um, some, some way to have some meaningful accountability. Um, they expressed re remorse, um, noting kind of what they have in their lives that the surviving loved ones of the person who was murdered may not have in their life. And so there's really this lovely theme in there um, around how one kind of picks themselves into a healing journey and how they transform and what that means for their relationships moving forward and how we think about harm doing generally. And they also are thinking about criminal justice reform and what their visions are for one that is a more meaningful form of accountability. And so, um, you know, we close the essay and thus close the book with inviting people to think about these themes of what does it mean to heal and transform um, especially when we're in places or in relationships that aren't safe, that where we feel dehumanized or disrespected and that sort of thing. And how can we take these lessons and apply them in our own real life? So there's really some hopeful, encouraging and inspiration that comes out of this book, which I think is really exciting. Howard, do you wanna reflect on some of the things, your takeaways? Well, I, there's a number of themes that really hit me, uh, struck me. One of them is just the importance of hope. I mean, that seems obvious, and yet you just have to have hope. In fact, the whole idea for this book partly came from a lifer in Alabama who I'd worked with for a long time, who wrote to me and said, you know, Howard, trying to serve a life sentence is like, like trying to keep a candle lit in a dark tunnel, and that candle is hope. So that's one thing. A second is just the struggle to be human in a dehumanizing environment. So many people talk about the things they do to try to remain human uh, and try to remain, to maintain positive values in a, in a context that was really dehumanizing. Uh, a third is the need to make meaning. All of us have a need to make meaning in our lives, but people serving life sentences often have a particular need to do that. One fellow, Tom Martin, told me in my first interview with him, he said, you know, you're a coffee drinker. I know you get up in the morning, you figure out you're going to where you get your coffee. So I get up in the morning and I figure out how I'm going to make meaning of this day because otherwise my life is meaningful, is meaningless. And that is, leads me to another one that's just an almost universal theme. And that is the need to do good, the need to give back. Uh, it's partly a way of meaning. It's a partly a way of repaying for the harm that they have caused. But that, that, uh, and research has shown that people who turn their lives around after committing wrong uh, usually do that partly by trying to find a way to do good. And that was a theme that came out very strongly in here. The other one just is the, the reminder that post-traumatic growth, which is what, what it's often called post-traumatic growth, is possible. But the people you're meeting here are people who have faced adversity and become stronger for it. The prison is a kind of trauma factory. Some people are just done in by it. Others face that trauma and find ways to grow. And most of the people you're going to meet in this book 
are people who have found ways to grow in the face of that adversity to find uh, to, to do some post-traumatic growth. Finally, a lesson for me is just a reminder how the quality of our lives, the quality of my life, depends on how we face adversity, whether we embrace adversity and try to learn from it or whether we just try to avoid it. Uh, these folks have made something themselves in their lives in spite of really almost unimaginable hardship. So those are some of the themes that strike me uh, looking back. Yeah. If, if I can chime in here just uh, one more time. Yeah, go ahead. Turn it oh. over to you. Tell us. <laughs> yeah. No. Um, yeah. When You know, like I, I spoke of how when I came into the system, you know, there was really, you know, not a lot of opportunities for people to do anything. And when and when they did start letting in programs, that's when you saw the ability of prisoners to excel. And when I say programs, I'm talking about uh, offering college courses, you know, uh, giving people the ability to tutor other people, you know, because uh, the early part, the early days of prison really segregated people a great deal. All the cells, all the prison, there was like eight prisons in Pennsylvania when I first went in. Every cell in every prison was single. They, they didn't have no doubling up system in, in state prisons. So, you know, there, there was a sort of isolation built in to the system where people really didn't have the opportunity to um, congregate a lot. There was a lot of um, uh, caution on, on, on congregating. So when, 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 when they offered and changed the system and allowed visitors and, and volunteers to start coming in, then this, this blossoming of minds, attitudes, uh, you know, goals, dreams, it, 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 ran, it ran rampant through the prison. And we had like the Brotherhood, J, we had the JCs come in to teach, you know, like if you know anything about the Brotherhood JCs, they were like a young businessman organization. Uh, they came in and offered different skills. We had like three universities. We had Temple, uh, Lincoln, Cheney, and Villanova come in and offer college courses. To just see the maturation of these guys that have been, you know, like pushed down so long, start, you know, like feeling the presence of, of having independence again, being able to be men, you know, share their ideas, share their uh, goals, you know, uh, build something. We had like, we had like four or five organizations. We suddenly had a lifers uh, program. We started having church organizations in the prison. And all these things were the combination of men now having the opportunity to actually grow and flourish. And in, in, and in respect, it gave the community a whole different perspective on, on prisoners. You know, no longer were we these individuals that uh, the minute you saw us, we were out to kill or hurt somebody or do damage or what have you. No, it was about how we can work with those coming into the prison uh, in our communities, deal with gang situation, deal with um, poverty because we we raised money and gave. Uh, I know for me, I was involved in uh, in in uh, organizing uh, runathons for big brothers and big sisters to collect money. I was uh, I participated and coordinated walkathons for the Bora Heart and Lung Foundation, and and there were so many more. We had a, a program in Philadelphia church of um, Father Washington had a church and they were, they needed to re uh, renovate it, you know, fix it up. We walked for things like that through uh, radio station announcements. So the idea that uh, programs is what really gave me and so many other, so many other prisoners the opportunity 
to show the to show that we were capable of giving back that we can we could develop the attitude the mind the language the you know be articulate you know about how we spoke about things and and the passion to want to change uh what was going on these are the things that uh when you when you uh, initiate those things inside a prison setting, that you find a whole different element of prisoner than you do when you just lock them down, beat them, you know, uh, act arbitrary in how in in in, in how you uh, minister pro you know minister their uh, activities and things like that. So my my I guess what I'm basically saying is. These are the things that we need to encourage the prison to do: become more uh, community-minded in how they treat those uh, on the inside. Give them more opportunities to uh, identify with the community that a lot of them may be returning to uh, one day. Thanks, Freddie. Alana, we'll turn it over to you so we can open up some conversations. Are you going to show run Craig's or not? You know, I forgot. Should I go back and show it? Uh, well, I don't know. It's up to you. You promised them. <laughs> I think it'd be great. Yeah, I think yeah, it's I, I, let's, to, let's do that. And then we can open it up for questions. Cool. Yeah, I realized I forgot. And then I was like, oh, okay, now let me go back to it. Oh, Let's share the screen. Sorry, I forgot to share my screen. I <laughs> learn to share. Yeah, I, I don't share well. Okay, now I gotta. There we go. Sorry. No worries. <laughs> I'll be sixty-four in June. I'm working on 35 years inside now, and I'm taking it one day at a time. I realize how much faith I have and hope I had in the system 25 years ago because I still had appeals in. When all appeals are dead, you start looking for something else to keep you going. It's a challenge keeping hope alive. Now I'm at the commutation stage. When I went up in 2014, I had good support, even the full support of the victim's family. But it was right at the cusp of the Goober national election, and I only got one vote after the merit review hearing. I'm trying again in a year. I'm hopeful. I could have taken a deal. They offered me a deal for third degree, and the attorney said, third degree is probably the most that you're going to be convicted of anyway, so I take the deal. It's up to you. This was right when they were picking the jury. I could have had 10 to 20 year sentence and maxed out 15 years ago. That pulls at me. I had no real interaction in the criminal justice system at all before, so I didn't have any kind of understanding of what it was. Even my victim sister said that the district attorney told her, He's got a life sentence, but he'll be out in 17 years. After 20 years, and I'm still not out, she started wondering why. Then another sister contacted the Apology Bank, where we had sent the letters to the Victim Offender Reconciliation Program, and she started to look up on the internet and saw articles I had written. The meeting with the victim's family, telling her what actually happened, was the best thing in my whole incarceration. She told me what the loss meant to her and was understanding of what it's done to me and how I've changed and grown. It's rewarding to know that even after 35 years, they aren't hating you, being vindictive or wishing you were dead. They're on my visitors list, send letters and cards and have written letters for my commutation. I did a TEDx talk about it in Greater Ford. The reconciliation program was really rewarding. It was funny how the fruits of something that you did 10 years ago come back so much later. It just kept growing. A life sentence is death by incarceration, different from having the death penalty where you know you're going to get it on a certain date. Here, you're just sentenced to die while you're living here. You really struggle to find meaning in life and get through day by day. The meaning of life is fleeting and fickle. It's all what you make of it. Meaning right now my is my job. I love computer programming. I love everything about it. I keep busy. I take part in programs like the Alternatives to Violence Project and the Lifers Organization. I finished my associate's degree. I worked in the dental lab for five years and 30 years in the correctional industries office. Programs like the reconciliation program and photography class give guys hope and a reason to get up or look forward. Once you get to a point where you're not doing anything, it gets a little melancholy. You can't sit around and do nothing. Everybody's anxious about the move from Greater Ford to Phoenix, the new prison. For all 35 years in, I never had a celly. 
but at the new prison we're moving to, every cell is a double. I'm hoping they'll let us choose our guys and I'll move in with an 82 year old friend. I just want somebody who wants to be left alone. It's going to be a drastic change. I've grown a little bit more realistic as far as how tough the system is, no matter what your issues are in the court. I realize how important family is and how satisfying it is to help others, tutoring other people, being there, sharing your experiences with them. It's more satisfying than constantly worrying about yourself and what you're going to do next or accomplish. I think that comes with maturity. Craig is one of the few lucky ones who had the opportunity to meet with the, per the surviving family members and, you know, connecting back to the themes. Um, that's something that many of them uh, wish they had that same opportunity. All right, Alana. All right. Um, I think you inspired me, Barb, to change it up a little from yesterday. So I'm going to actually <laughs> hold. I'm going to hold off on my questions and um, and just open it up. See if others in the group um, have any thoughts, and I'll keep an eye on the chat as well. But just want to open it up. Yeah. Hi. Um, thank you all so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Um, I'm Emily. And when I look at these photos, I think a lot about the theme of time and the passage of time. And so my question is actually for Freddie. Um, on a very human level, you know, our perception of time changes as we get older. And I was just wondering what it was like for you to serve that sentence, which was it 50 years? Uh, 40, 49 and, and, and some. And yeah. so like, how did, I don't know, I hope my question makes sense. Like, how did time feel for you? Did it go slow? Did it go fast? Did it change? Did your perception of time change when you left? Like, what was that like for you? Well, um, I, I, as I, I, I expressed yesterday, for me, uh, it went, it went really fast. I, I would mm -hmm. say because um, of my involvement. I mean, I was doing something uh, almost every day. Uh, I, I spoke to, you know, like programs coming in and, and that was new for just about everybody in the prison. So the opportunity now, you know, to get an education. So first I had to get, um, I had to get to the point where I can get a GED. So that meant, you know, learning how to read. That meant learning how to write. Uh, learn, you know, just basic stuff. And then uh, after that, um, you know, I had, I went to work in, in, in a dental lab and guys started teaching me how to type. Uh, I used to use a, like a little piece of cardboard with all the letters from the typewriter on it and sit in my cell and, and, and do that for, for, you know, hours, you know, like I said, we was all single cell. Um, of course, you know, the time you could look from the pictures and see that, of course, the, the time took its toll on a lot of us physically, but, uh, mentally time is really a slow, uh, process, you know, uh, you know, we're behind in, in, in everything. When, when I got out in 2019, I, I wanted to do everything I ever dreamed of. I wanted to be involved in my community. I wanted to take some of the programs that I had put on paper and try to like infuse them into, uh, you know, organizations um, that I was involved in. Uh, in. In last year, I was finally able to create Meeting at the Door through uh, our Yo Fellow Prison Ministry program, which allows us to uh, go up to the prison once people reach out and are coming out. We, uh, we, we provide transportation. We give them clothing, we buy them uh, communication devices, we take them out for a meal, and we address, you know, like um, we connect them with other resources. But um, yeah, the time, the time on our body is one thing, but the time on in, in our thoughts and what have you is very different. Um, you know, I still think that um like for lack of uh, maybe a true expression, like 30. 20 late 20s early 30s my you know my mind is still very active you know uh in in my writing and my thinking about 
what, how I can be utilized in my community whenever I sit with somebody uh, and they want to do something, you know, I'm, I'm right there. You know, my mind is like, oh, oh, how can we do this? You know, which way can we go? How can we, you know, bring people together? So, yeah, I mean, in one aspect of it is kind of slow, but mentally I, and emotionally, I think it goes very quickly for a lot of guys in prison, especially when they're involved, you know, when they're, when they're, when they're at, in the process of bettering themselves and, and discovering what they can give of themselves and what they can produce from their thoughts and their ideas and experience of just being, be seeing things in a very, objective uh, position from a very objective position. One thing that this reminds me of, one of the themes that you hear in the book from the women in the book is there seem to be fewer resources for them, fewer activities for them to participate in and fewer opportunities for them to consider, to receive consideration for commutation. So there seems to be a real differential uh, in the way women are treated and the way men are treated in this process. Uh, Barb, do you have anything to add on that? Yeah. Well, I was just thinking too, they, they run out of things to do. A few of them talk about that and mm -hmm. how that can really make time drag when you've done all the programs. You're programmed out, basically. Howard and I are former professors, so we can sit in silence for as long. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. okay. I'm, I'm, I'm a current professor and I can't. Uh, <laughs> uh, Bobby's hand. I actually have three questions. I know lawyers aren't supposed to ask compound questions. First one's easy. Where's the best place other than Amazon to get your book? Uh, your local bookseller, order it through them. Uh, second question is, is there a risk of, um, more programming within facilities that makes it easier for judges to decide to send people to prison? Oh, that, that was good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Who wants to start? Well, you know what? Uh, realistically, judges don't think that way. It, well, they don't know much about prisons to start. Right? With. Yeah, that's yeah. They 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 don't think that way because number one, they're not really sending them there for rehabilitation. They're sending them there for punishment. So you know their their table of contents for for sending sentencing a person and putting them in prison only has to do with the nature of the crime and how, uh, you know, what they've, the harm that they've done to society, you know, not whether or not, uh, they, they don't even know half the time how educated somebody that comes before them are. You know, th this, this thought process about um, investigative reports before a person is sentenced and what have you, and the judge has that all in front of him, well, that's a myth. Uh, you know, because, and even if they had it, uh, you know, if you take a jury trial, the judge has no real say about the sentence in which he must impose upon you. So, you know, sending, sending a person to prison or not sending them to prison because, uh, they, you know, there's an opportunity for them to actually change and better their lives or what have you, you know, isn't really on the judge's list of uh, any rationale for a sentence in a person. Did, did that something. answer your question? Yeah, that was great. I do, I do have some concerns about that. As you know, there's so many hopeful, positive, transformative messages in the book. And, you know, I do have a little kind of fear in the back of my head that someone will say, oh yeah, you know what? Prison really is a good place. Look, they did transform there. So let's actually send people to prison. Um, so that that's there in the back of my mind, but I'm gonna trust Howard and Freddie that that's not gonna happen. 
So that's a perfect segue to my third question. I often get asked, what's the difference between restored, restorative justice and transformative justice? And I'm curious if you see any distinction between those two philosophies or concepts. I, I can you want to take a barb. I can yeah, start yeah. and then you yeah, guys can all, add. All. So I I yeah, I think that's a great question. I think they are different things. Um, I think there's hints of transformative justice in restorative justice, but it's been a quieter part. Um, so um I I've heard them called cousins. And I think they really need to go together. And I think the way the restorative justice field is moving is that they're getting closer and closer and closer. That restorative justice has really provided this great foundation on how we can approach harm doing differently. Um, and what transformative justice offers is that an extension to, to say, okay, we got to look at what accountability and healing mean in the context of systems and structures and how we've organized society. And um, you know, part, depending on what approach you take to restorative justice, you know, thinking about Howard's questions, sometimes there's a question that gets put in there of what are the root causes of harm doing, and that's not just about why a person, um, kind of some flaw of the person, that it may actually be growing out of community structures and unjust and inequitable systems, and so we need to actively be changing and transforming and holding systems accountable for harm that's been caused and continues to be caused and acknowledging um, historic harms as well, particularly as they relate to communities of color. So there's a lot of work there that needs to be done. And I think bringing them together is um, gonna be really important, especially if we wanna be, you know, um, having community safety and, you know, public safety, which feels like such a criminal legal system way of talking about um, community safety. So that's where I'll start. I think, yeah, I can't answer better than that. Freddie, you got anything? Well, you know, like, um, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, so there's a question in the chat. Uh, I'm not sure if you all can see it, but it says yesterday Bob talked about no prison, no prison can she share more about that vision, please. So I'm guessing that's sort of like, what does an abolition model look like in your eyes? Yeah, so a question came up yesterday. I think that sparked it was along the lines of is incapacitation necessary? with restorative or or not part of restorative justice. It was something along those lines, I think. And so um, I had multiple responses to that in that someone can be incapacitated and still engage in some in a restorative justice practice. So for instance, Craig talks about having met with the surviving family members and that would have occurred in the prison during his period of incarceration. So they aren't necessarily mutually exclusive. Um, the question becomes, is it ever possible to do, uh, to not have incapacitation? Can a restorative justice model address um, everything that we want to have happen? And um, I like to think that there is a way to actually do restorative justice without ever sending someone to prison and incarcerating them. Um, incarceration is just so dehumanizing, violent. Um, it doesn't do what we want it to do. It ignores what um, survivors need, doesn't address their needs. Um, I think there is a way we can create a process um, where we're addressing needs, we're holding people accountable and um, really doing some amazing community building work in the process. That said, there are times when all of us in our lives just need to get away from people, either because we're gonna lose it on other people and hurt them, or we're gonna get so stressed out or whatever that we're gonna hurt ourselves. 
And so we have to be thinking about um, how do we create um, those boundaries, those separations, those maybe changed up types of relationship for a period of time that don't require incarceration in any sort of way. And that might be, um, you know, thinking about if someone, um, you know, has harmed another person and let's say it grows out of their trauma, um, trauma research is showing that, you know, unresolved trauma energy can turn into hurting oneself or hurting others. Um, maybe there is um, trauma treatment place or um, a trauma retreat center or something like that, that's really focused on addressing those kinds of things because the separation from the community is to work on those kinds of issues. So I don't, I think we have to kind of always be thinking about when are the times when maybe relationships need to be changed up and how do we do that in a way that is recognizing people's humanity is actually getting at um, what's going on behind harm doing um, as opposed to just punishing people. So I, I would have a vision of no prison in, you know, in my most ideal imagination, um, what, how we would get there, whether we could get there. Um, I'd like to be hopeful, but I'm not quite sure. We can. Some of these Scandinavian models of prisons that try to, to create healthy communities that are as much like living outside as possible and equip people to live outside give some hope that there may be ways for time out that's more restorative yeah, than what we know here as prisons. Yeah, I, I think <clears throat> I think the issue, you know, of um, overcrowded prison conditions makes a lot of what Barb and them are talking about very difficult. And I say that because um, in, in, in the early 90s, they, they created a, a classification level for prisoners. And it had to do, uh, some worked outside and lived outside. Um, some were custody level two prisoners, which um, basically indicated no violence or very small uh, or victimist crimes were a part of that custody level two. And then you had your three and then your max and then your, of course, your death row uh, prisoners. Well, you know, in, in the greater scheme of things, that was supposed to give certain prisoners the opportunity to really, ex or be examined through uh, institutional programming and things to take responsibility for, 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 for what they've done, take responsibility for their crime, understand where uh, that violent activity might have originated from. And now that's that's gone, you know, like anything to do with uh, basically, let's go back to what I originally said, anything basically that deals with rehabilitation right now, is like off the table for the most part. You know, if if you're not getting out within six months, uh, even even when in my situation, going back one more time, when when um, I came up for resentencing in uh, 2018, when they finally decided that the Miller decision and Montgomery made it retroactive, that I could go back down and get resentenced. That was the only time that the prison mandated that I take certain programs to uh, be in accords with their requirements for me to possibly get out. None of what I had accomplished prior to that was even on the books. If I don't have my own records of participating in school, college programs, being uh, the, the president of organizations, uh, creating organizations, being in, involved in community affairs. None of that was a part of my record. None of that showed any part of my rehabilitation. And the staff that I went to, because they didn't have that, they gave me a hit. I had to do nine more months 
of a program before I came up for parole again. And then they granted it. So these, you know, like in order to get to uh, transformative justice, uh, uh, you know, uh, you you need you need things to address uh, what it is to create that restorative part where everybody plays a part in in the overall uh, scheme of what harm a person has done and what harm people experience as a result of that person. And these are the things that are not on the table. And that's my opinion of what makes transformative and restorative justice very difficult, you know, in, in, in our correctional uh, institution, at least in Pennsylvania. Yeah. Hi, hi, can you hear me, Sammy? Hi, hi. Um, I have a question for you, Barb, because I know you said that you're anti having prisons, but the truth is people are very wicked and they desire to harm others. Um, but are you against, are you for, sorry, um, abolishing the 13th Amendment, which is very clear, it says, except for punishment of the crime, then a person is back in enslavement, black and white enslavement. Actually, all races can be enslaved by law. Um, and I wanted to know, are you for, abolishing the 13th Amendment. So if one has to go to prison due to their own actions, or maybe they're going to prison for their own convictions, whatever it may be, that they won't be enslaved while they're going through their incarceration? Question number one. You know, I don't think about it in terms of constitutional amendments, so I'm not gonna answer that question. Um, I think absolutely there, there shouldn't be any slavery anywhere at all in our system ever. And unfortunately it still exists in the carceral system, but I think also in other areas as Did well. Okay. I'll look oh, at sorry. your phone charge in a minute. Um, I'm sorry. It's okay. <laughs> so I, yeah, I don't, there shouldn't be slavery anywhere anywhere where we do it. And unfortunately, it's still there. So um, just because I'm not a legal scholar, and I'm just not well versed in in constitutional amendments, including that one, I don't even want to make a comment on abolishing a constitutional amendment. I mean, on the surface. Um, yeah, I I move to question number two to you, Mr. Freddy. Um, you know, a wise man once told me that fools multiply when wise men are silent. Name the number one thing that we are silent about as someone who was, I always have to say what the law says, by law, you were enslaved. Um, so I wanted to know what were we silent about? What have we been silent about from your experience? Well, I mean, we, we've been silent about the double standards of, of our a criminal justice system. And, and uh, basically the injustice is not the people per se, is but the laws for, well, when you say not the people, you know, what they do is, is they hide behind the law. They create a law that creates prejudice, creates um, victimization, um, you know, bigotry. And, and, and we all move forward with that instead of questioning it. Um, and and that's, the, that's the biggest thing that I think we've been silent about when, you know, like uh, I always, you know, I talk about it on, at, on a regular basis, this uh, double felony rule that they have across a lot of states where, you know, they say a homicide is the killing of a person and you can get A, B, and C, but when you talk about giving a person a sentence because they accomplished they were an accomplice with somebody, but didn't do anything to perpetuate the homicide and you give them the same sentence, that's bad. You know, not only bad for the people that are given those sentences, but our community as well, because right now we have a system where we lock people away and don't even look at them again, you understand, before their sentences are up. We don't go back in and say, you know, at, at 15, 16, and 17, was this an appropriate sentence for him? Let's look at him now. Let's bring him out. 
you know, you got a commutation system in a lot of states right now also where they're saying, you know, it's got to be a majority decision, you know, for a person to even go before a commutation process to have the opportunity for the governor to even, you know, like use his authority. So yeah, those, those are the things that I think we are basically silenced about the injustice and how discriminatory and prejudiced it is across the board. And we gotta realize that in a lot of states where this is happening, especially in Pennsylvania for the longest, the laws in Pennsylvania have mostly been constructed by all white people, by all white people. So once again, my history of being in prison and what I've learned over the years, when I first went in, it was predominantly white. And in the predominantly white era of prisons, once again, all of them were single cell. No one, no one shared a cell. You had people, you had life sentence prisoners working outside. You had furlough programs. Uh, you had speaking engagements where people, of, regardless of their sentence, could go out and speak to the community. You know, all those things. Now that the system is majority Black, we have none of that. Education has been totally just about eradicated across the state now that more Black people are being confined and in prison. So, you know, that's... That's what we don't speak to. Just one more. What is it worse, being sent to jail by your own people or by a judge? What was that? What is worse, being sent to prison incarceration by your own people as in a jury trial or being sent by a judge? I think a jury trial because people are so basically unaware of all the intricacies that go into a person, you know, coming before them, what's going to happen to them. At least if you had a judge, you could technically, you know, make him understand that maybe this is a first time offense. Maybe there was some uh, mitigating circumstances. Uh, and that's another issue. Juries can't determine mitigating circumstances. Judges can and they can apply mitigating circumstances to their sentence. So, you know, like if I had to do my case all over again, I, I wouldn't have took a jury. I probably would have took a judge because like I said, I had two co-defendants that only did 11 and, and seven, 18, 11 and 18 months for the same offense that I got life for. So yeah, in, high, in hindsight, I probably would have took a judge because he could have he could have considered the fact that I had 10 other siblings. My mom was a single mom. My dad was abusive and a drunk. Uh, I didn't have an education. I lived in a poverty stricken area. You know, I had already been victimized by the system by being taken away from my family for four or five different times before, you know, the homicide came up. So yeah, I, you know, I, I think a I think a judge, in, in in many instances, because you can educate them about the person, and maybe put some things on the table that would be mitigating factors for sending the person away for the rest of their life. Any other questions in the room? Um, I had one from that I was was kind of a follow up from something that you shared yesterday. Um, the three of you actually spoke to this in different ways, but I'm curious. Um, again, this group is predominantly folks who are working somewhere within the criminal legal system, um, for the most part, and I'm just wondering your thoughts on the role of community, um, both those who may be working professionally as service providers in some way um, or or general community members, what the role is on their part in the reintegration process. I was struck yesterday, Freddie, when you were mentioning 
um, how limited those mechanisms of support look and how high the stakes are to, you know, from community members who really have nothing to do with individuals um, or even the system at large who feel entitled to have so um, so much to say and think about what um, what reentry should look like and what the expectations are around that, but very little around sort of mutually what should be provided in as a sort of reciprocal relationship in that in that reintegration process. Well, you know, my 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 feelings is, and I don't want to, you know, I know Barb and them probably definitely have thoughts about, uh, you know, reentry, but um, yeah, I mean, I think I mean to to help make a person successful, and that that's one of the reasons why I was uh, very, um, you know, thought thought moving about creating meeting at the door, is because there are there aren't many resources available to guys coming out anymore. Families aren't as involved for one reason or other with, with that whole process. And, and the other thing that I think people don't realize is that the two biggest things for people to get uh, when, they, when, when they're going up for parole is jobs and a place to live. And because the system is so archaic now about allowing technological stuff into prisons. This puts most people coming out of prisons so far behind the eight ball that they really can't even catch up. They can't go online to create applications to companies. They can use computers to develop their skills and, and become, now I know y'all heard what Craig Datesman said about loving computer computers and stuff, but he's rare. I mean, rare, 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 you know, of being involved. He works in an office, you know, so they need those type of things. But throughout the general population, most prisoners aren't being computer literate. Most people don't even, when they get out, they can't even operate a phone, you know. So employers, you know, the, the parole board requires that you put in an application for a job. Well, you can't do that anymore because, you know, jobs are paperless, you know, so and they don't allow you to go on on a computer to put in an application. And then there's still the horrific stigma of background checks. You know, most people are coming out of jail. Why even, you know, why even ask if they got a record? <laughs> you know, you know, I, I'm not going to hire you because you got a record, you know, and for me, um, I couldn't live certain places because number one, my crime wasn't 50 years old. I couldn't sign a lease to live any place because I had a, my crime wasn't 50 years old. And I couldn't sign a lease at other places because the sentence that I did receive in 2019 required me to be on parole for the rest of my life. So, you know, these are the obstacles that a lot of people face in transitioning and reentering the community. They don't have the resources to be, to even make it. And, the, and that's why the recidivism rate for a lot of people coming out is so great that it, it seems like it's, it's almost useless sometimes for people to even try to come out because they're going to wind up coming right back. Some of the things that I think about when it comes to reentry is one, why are we even creating and using a system where reentry is necessary? Um, why aren't we working to make reentry moot? And that basically means stop taking people out of the community so that they have to reenter re to it. So that's that's that. And I think, you know, and, and I'm hearing what Freddie is saying and also want to add, I think this is another area where we need to think about transformative justice, about how our societal structures. Um, have put people in a position, and I, th I think um, some of them certainly by design, where they're not going to be able to re-enter and become an equal and vibrant member of the community. And so I, th I think we need to be looking at how some of those systems work. How is our um, employment systems working? How are 
uh, food systems working? How are housing systems working? And how are they set up to disadvantage certain people? That Because you can do all you want with helping people um, get a job, get housing, but that it's not going to work unless we actually um, address those structural issues. And just while I'm talking, if I can go back to the Constitution question about the 13th Amendment, I needed some time to think about it because I've never been asked a question about the Constitution before. Um, so, you know, with that 13th Amendment, I think we need to be really honest with ourselves that there's some intention, there is intentionality in the design and how um, so that people of color remain enslaved and how the criminal justice system has been used as the tool to continue with white supremacy and um, disadvantaging communities of color and destroying communities of color. And I think we need to have a very serious, public, truthful conversation about that amendment and what it's done and how it lives out today. And so, um, yeah, we need to be acknowledging what that did and what it continues to do and the harm and the damage that it continues to do by design to certain people in our society. And I think that that conversation then also fits into how is that then come into play in other societal structures that we have that interact with or adjacent to the criminal justice system, which is every single part of our society is somehow connected to the criminal justice system. I'm sorry, the criminal legal system. It's not about justice. Yeah. Good point, good point. All right, I'm gonna take a peek and see if we have a um, quick question. Otherwise I can always send these to you. Um, my work in the cluster, I've been told by these who are I, I have a response for it. Do you want me to read it and then respond? That would be great. Okay. Thanks, Barb. And then we'll close out with a, just a closing round like yesterday. Uh, in my, okay. In my work with incarcerated men, I've been told by those who work in the jail and reentry, mm -hmm. Quote, quote, unquote, they have criminal minds and don't think like you and I, quote, unquote, you can't believe anything they say, quote, unquote, they're liars and manipulators, and they don't want to be part of the solutions. They're just telling you that so you'll stick around and pay attention to them. This is especially troubling coming from the director of reentry who is perpetuating the stigma. What response do you have to those sorts of responses? Um, my response is no, I think exactly like them. No, um, then you can't believe everything I say. Um, they're liars and manipulators. Yeah, you know, I am too sometimes. And they don't want to be part of the solutions. They're just telling you that you'll stick around and pay attention to them. Yeah, and I go to meetings because you're serving food. And um, there's no other reason I go except because I want a snack and they better have cookies. And um, so I, I, I really take great offense at... Um, this whole thing of criminal thinking, because when you look at the examples that are there, they're the way I think every day, depending on the situation that I'm in. And I think it's really a dehumanizing way and a way of othering people um, when they're just acting the way we do. And it's just that they've done something, commit harm some in a way that we've decided is deemed crime, as opposed to just harm someone because in a way that, that's harmed someone. One of the things I'm learning from um, an organization here is really about you know, how so much of our language is systems language. And that you know, when we think about restorative justice, we're concerned with harm. We're not concerned with crime because crime actually only addresses one particular harm. And that's the harm that we've decided sometimes unfairly um, is to be criminalized and put into the system. And I think we need to start not thinking in that binary of crim criminals and crime and the rest of us when we all caused harm. It's just that not all of it is criminalized. Criminal thinking is normal human thinking. It's just we think about it 
in either a social context or in ways that things have been criminalized. So, I mean, does that help you interact with that director of the reentry program? I don't know, but that's how I think about it. Well, and remember, fo folks are coming out of a correct so-called correctional system that in itself is manipulative, and they've learned to survive in that, you know? Uh, so, you know, it doesn't bring the best out of people, you know? But, you know, interesting, it reminds me, when I did Doing Life, there was an exhibit, and we had a conference at Greaterford uh, Prison. Uh, Freddie's talked about Greaterford Prison. And the, super, the assistant superintendent of the prison came up to me, and I was expecting him to say, yeah, you, this is what these guys told you, but you, let me tell you what they're really like. He didn't say that. He said, you know, you've got these guys exactly right. I'm glad you did this. I thought, now there, now that's something, you know? Uh, so anyway, uh, those are my thoughts on it. Thank you. I'm wondering, um, as a closing, closing thought, um, I'm wondering if you could each share a hope and offer maybe an idea of how the book could be used as a teaching tool. What is one way you'd like to offer as an idea that this could be used, that we could all bring forth in our own work and lives as a teaching tool? Well, I'll start out with one of the way people have used this book and my other books, and the, the victim book, is they would take the pictures without telling who they are, and they would put pictures from of crime victims and of lifers on the wall and ask people in the class who they think these are. And it's really interesting because they'll say, oh, this person's probably a CEO of a corporation, you know, you find out they're a lifer. Uh, or, you know, just you, you find out all your stereotypes about who's who just don't work. So one way to do it is just to use them as a starting point. Another thing classes have done is each morning in a class, the class would begin by reading one of the stories just as a way to begin the class. And Barb, you've used that in other more creative ways than that. But those are just two that come to mind. Yeah, I've used them in the way that Howard suggested with putting photos out and having people pick one and kind of talk about why they picked that one, what do they notice about them and, and that sort of thing. Um, I also use it as a textbook in my class. Um, I'm teaching adult corrections last quarter and this quarter, and um, they read, they get to choose which ones that they want to read. And then, you know, have conversations around how does this fit with, for instance, how the textbook is talking about people who are in prison and very different ways the textbook has a pretty dehumanizing perspective of people in prison. And this offers us other kinds of um, perspective on it. And I work, um, our students by nature of who we are as an institution, our students who are juggling full-time jobs, kids at home, multi-generational households, um, all that sort of stuff. Many come with their own PTSD ratings, either because they're uh, vets or they have fled country as refugees. And so we also have conversations about what can you, um, as fellow humans, learn from the folks in this book about how to make your way through the challenges that you face in your life. And um, they take away a lot of personal things from that. Yeah, uh, one one of the things that came up when uh, me and Barb was in Philadelphia and we was uh, dealing with the display, what people don't realize from in the time span that Dr. Zare uh, did these photos, what changes went on in the prison system? And the changes were very subtle. If you look at the pictures that he took in the 90s, people had on street clothes and were very individualized. If you look at them, they had a different aura about them in, in, in the 90s versus the ones that we did in 2017, where everybody had to wear something brown. The system had, you know, like took away, you know, just this little, just this little thing of having your individual clothing that made you feel different about, you know, like walking in the prison, going in the prison, going to different things. 
And those were the subtle changes of the system becoming, I would say, a little more suppressive, you know, uh, in, in, in 2017 when Doc came in. Uh, even, even the way in which uh, we, we took the pictures uh, in, in, in uh, 20, uh, 1992 was different. You know, staff was different. Uh, you know, uh, the way they cooperated, the way they were, you know, willing to participate in some kind of way to help the process move on. So those are just some subtle ways that you can, uh, when you look at these pictures, you might identify uh, the changes in the system at that time. And well, why did they go from allowing these guys to be photographed in different clothing that they could wear different shirts, you know, uh, poses and things of that nature to like one streamlined set of clothing and so forth and on. So that that that's something that uh, I, I've, I've been able to talk to people about uh, whenever I have uh, an opportunity to use the book. Well, thank you all so much. Welcome.